Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the January edition of the European Urology Podcast, our first podcast of 2024. Uh, On behalf of myself, Declan Murphy, urologist here in Melbourne, and my co-host, Joyce Bard, urologist in Amsterdam, we'd like to wish you all a very happy 2024. Um, Anything you're looking forward to in 2024, Joyce? Oh, well, um, I think there are a lot of things where I can look forward to, but I have uh, one main event I will finally have my PhD defense in April. So for me, that's a big thing. For anybody, that's a big thing. Well, we're all behind you. Your, your PhD <laughs> defense in April. Well, look, uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to it. It's kind of a, it's almost, it's a, it's something you should look forward to because the end is in sight on, uh, yes. on the enormous commitment of a PhD. So, well, best of luck with that. And Thank you. does that mean you won't be able to Anything go to... Anything for you. Oh, for me, um meetings i mean it's this time of the year where suddenly here in australia it's summertime the kids are still off school but we begin to look ahead to think okay what meetings am i going to go to um and for me my eldest uh, son kian is doing his final high school exams uh, year 12 exams we call them so um uh, i therefore want to hang around australia as much as i can so i would normally go to asco gu okay. in a few weeks time but i'm not going to that um i will go to eau and apccc in april but i'm trying to you know stay around home a little bit and uh, support the family as we get through uh, something like a PhD defense is getting through your year 12 exams it does seem like the biggest thing in the world at the time but um, like all these things it fades into the past very quickly once you move on to uh, the next thing in life um, but yeah no PhD defense will be will be really rooting for you I'm sure you'll do very well indeed uh, in April Joyce that's fantastic but what else yeah. to look forward to? I, you know, it's it, it, you still have that slight feeling of post-COVID, don't you? That it wasn't that long ago where you couldn't do things, you couldn't go to meetings, you couldn't have family events and so on. So I think hopefully, uh, despite various conflicts around the world, hopefully 2024, we can have a sense of uh, normality in our personal and professional lives. And um, But it is very difficult to avoid uh, discussions about uh, conflict because it affects so many people out there, so many um, uh, friends and uh, colleagues and urologists who are involved in various conflicts conflict zone so that that's always in my thoughts I must say as well as we um, connect with our friends around the world and let's hope we can look forward to more peaceful times um, in the various conflicts we have around the world um, but I think there is a lot to look forward to in a, in a relatively normal urology sense in 2024 and here at the journal at European Urology um, we're now in January this is the January edition and the new editorial board led by Alberto Briganti kicks into effect from this week um, it's a transition period for the last six months as Jim Cato and his editorial board uh, finished out and then Alberto Briganti and his new editorial board um, are coming in. So there are some changes coming in the journal that uh, we've been discussing within the the new editorial board and we'll get Alberto and some of the other associate editors on in the next month or two to talk about those changes. It's not just changes in personnel but there will be some changes to article types which those of you who like to submit to this great journal uh, will certainly be interested in so that'll be coming up in the next few months. But um, this edition is jam-packed as usual. We've got two really really good papers to talk about. Um, One is the EANM consensus on molecular imaging and theranostics in prostate cancer um, so that's a fast moving area any of you in, interested in prostate cancer will be interested in this paper this consensus and the second one is um, a, another prostate cancer paper uh, a, f- a prospective trial the forecast trial looking at the role of multi-parametric, multi-parametric MRI in assessing patients with radio recurrent prostate cancer so two very hot papers and of course coming up later in the podcast our usual have a look at what else is going on in the journal um, one of our senior trainees from Ireland uh, Stephanie Crowan is joining us to talk about that um, but let's kick off and go to our first paper of the month it's the forecast trial and uh, I I caught up with first author Daniela Oprea Lager and also with Roderick Vandenberg uh, to comment on this paper. So for our first paper on uh, this January edition of the European Urology podcast, uh, we're very excited to highlight this um, 
EANM Focus, the European Association of Nuclear Medicine Focus. Number five is what they're calling it. It's a consensus on molecular imaging and theranostics in prostate cancer. And what a great way to kick off the year talking about one of our favorite topics. But because it's such a fast moving topic and we all have questions about what type of imaging, what type of tracers, what type of theranostics, etc., um, we really welcome this uh, key publication in European urology. And we're really pleased to have uh, first author Daniela Oprea Lager, a nuclear medicine physician from the Department of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine at Amsterdam University's Medical Center, uh, joining us to discuss this paper, and also to welcome Roderick Vandenberg, a urologist and a good old friend of mine. He actually did a fellowship here in Melbourne many, many years ago, uh, Roderick, um, who's a consultant urologist at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. So, Daniela and Roderick, uh, thanks very much for joining us on the European Urology Podcast. Thank you very much, Declan, for the kind invitation. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Terrific. So we thought we would uh, kick off by asking Daniela as best she can with such a big paper. And of course, the link is in the show notes. So you can have a look yourselves um, to give us a little bit about the rationale for this consensus and maybe some of the key points in the uh, in the areas that you've highlighted. And then we'll ask Roderick uh, to take you through a few questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm very proud to be a part of the European Association of Nuclear Medicine and uh, ENM, our association, is organizing actually uh, every year, starting with uh, 2018, uh, a focus meeting. And uh, as the evidence was pointing on uh, teranostics in prostate cancer to be the most uh, dynamic and rapidly uh, evolving uh, field in oncology in the last uh, five years, uh, the, the choice for a new topic was uh, obvious. So uh, under the motto, uh, the future begins today, was the fifth edition of uh, ENM Focus uh, organized, and this was on molecular imaging and teranostics in prostate cancer. Uh, this was uh, scheduled in uh, February in um, 2023 uh, in uh, Sevilla in Spain, and the aim of this um, uh, meeting was to critically uh, review developments in molecular hybrid imaging, but also in radio ligand uh, therapy uh, in prostate cancer in order to reach a multidisciplinary uh, consensus on uh, the current st uh, state of the art in prostate cancer. So the meeting was really attended by 300 uh, participants, and we were happy to, to have people all around the, the world from uh, four continents from 34 uh, countries. Um, yes. Yeah, terrific. It's quite a it's quite a big deal logistically putting this group of international multidisciplinary experts together. So congratulations to everybody for doing that. And um, the, the the statements themselves, uh, the the modified Delphi process that was used to reach those conclusions, are well described uh, in the paper. Um, and then yeah. I was particularly interested in the different uh, tracks, uh, track one, two, three, four, five that you um, yes. you you um, uh, highlighted and that you voted on and reached consensus on really in quite a few areas. Um, um, Roderick, I'll hand over to you for your observations and the highlights of the paper you want to get through. And of course, for audience out there, we cannot go through this in great detail. We want to get the highlights for you, but we really um, encourage you to go and find this paper. The links are in the show notes when you want to dig into the real detail. Roderick, over to you. So I, I first like to congratulate Daniela on this important work, uh, of course. Um, she has been important in uh, PSMA research. I think we all agree that a lot of things have been happening. Uh, first of all, PSMA has provided us on more detail in staging of the disease, but also new molecular characteristics of the tumor. So I think these consensus meetings, I see them as like a forerunner before the evidence and the guidelines come afterwards. So I think in the, in the areas where there are gaps in knowledge, these consensus meetings provide us really important guidance in how to well manage our uh, patients. And I think we're all are in this together, we all need to have some guidance in how to do this, how to stage people, how to treat them, how to use PSMA in the best way. I, and my first question to Daniela is how to select the participants and how to select the actual statements for the consensus. Because if you select the right participants and the right statements, you will have 100% consensus, won't you? Yes, it's a, it's a very uh, good question, Roderick. Uh, I fully agree. Uh, I have to say that we started uh, the preparations uh, two years prior to this consensus meeting, and it started with uh, uh, 
literature uh, research, we try to identify the gaps in the literature, actually. Uh, of course, we um, uh, were uh, wanting to, uh, to keep up with the uh, publications, with everything that is new and everything was uh, what was published uh, after 2020, so that we really have the, uh, the highest level of evidence and the new uh, level of evidence. Um, and we were very happy to, to identify um, this uh, literature and to organize the whole spectrum of prostate cancer into five tracks into initial staging, but also restaging of uh, prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer, and also radioligand therapy in advanced prostate cancer. And the fifth uh, track was uh, on the important factors when uh, developing such a consensus meeting. And we identify uh, 300 uh, participants, so uh, actually participants that were willing to discuss together with us uh, about uh, the prostate cancer, and they were not only radiologists and nuclear medicine physicians, but uh, importantly, it was really a multidisciplinary consensus, including our friends from urology, from uh, medical oncology, and from radiation uh, oncology, as well uh, basic uh, uh, scientists that are involved in the field of prostate cancer. And we were also very happy and honored to have 28 uh, expert uh, panel members uh, who were uh, indeed uh, uh, medical specialists from all the uh, fields that I already mentioned uh, and uh, who were willing to participate into this um, uh, two rounds of Delphi uh, process in which we um, address some uh, questions uh, and in which we try to um, also uh, provide um, the, the current uh, state of the art, uh, the current gaps in the literature. We asked uh, uh, specialists uh, to, to provide uh, lectures, pro and contrast, uh, of course, dealing with uh, with the five tracks, and then to identify and to to have uh, good interactions with the uh, participants and the uh, experts. And I, yeah. when going through all the statements, I found some of them actually pretty obvious. Uh, so it yes. was for me not surprising that there was a consensus. Uh, other ones were pretty progressive. One says that. Patients diagnosed with oligometastatic disease and PSMA should receive local treatment and uh, oligometastatic treatment as well. And there are a few other ones which are really like looking into the future. Um, and did you see that on these more provocative statements there was less consensus? Uh, I think uh, uh, there was consensus, uh, especially in the initial staging and the restaging of prostate cancer, which is quite obvious because it was also uh, somehow in line with the current guidelines that we have. For instance, we know that multiparametric MRI is the imaging modality to, to stage uh, patients with prostate cancer, but we also know that there is important and it's, it was consensus for the use of PSMA in the uh, intermediate with a, a bad prognosis and also in the high-risk prostate cancer. So these are really indeed uh, obvious uh, statements uh, where it was a consensus. But it was also provocative, especially in the radioligand uh, therapy field, especially when uh, we want to select the patients, how to select the patients, and how important is dosimetry to help us identifying the best candidates for this uh, um, treatments with uh, PSMA-based radioligand therapies. And I think the most uh, challenging uh, questions were about the bone marrow involvement, about the use of different types of tracers, for instance, FDG and PSMA, in order to select the best candidate. Do we always need to have two types of PET tracers? And of course, it depends from country to country and from the budget uh, that you have for your imaging uh, per country. So there were some challenges indeed and uh, nice discussions between the participants and the experts. Yes. As a urologist, I, I would have some uh, suggestions for future consensus meetings because I think there are still a few questions uh, open. One of them, for my idea, is who could avoid MRI and could get direct PSMA? So uh, I think there is an overlap, like for a patient with a PSA of 30, 
think the added value of MRI is is limited and a direct yes. PSMA may be the future. I think another open question is still who can avoid lymph node dissection? Because you give some suggestions that we should use the information of PSMA. Yeah. But we still don't know how to use it best. You are absolutely right. Yes, I think um, leaving the multiparametric MRI behind and starting uh, only with uh, PSMA, it's also challenging, especially because we know that there are some 5 to 10% of patients having a PSMA negative uh, expression. So probably in that patients, even if they are high risk prostate cancer, having no PSMA expression, it will be very challenging. It will be impossible to stage these patients. So I think especially for these candidates, there is still a place for multiparametric MRI. And indeed, we have noticed and we also perform research in this field that the use of uh, and the incorporation of advanced modalities uh, like uh, whole body MRI and also PSMA PET in the nomograms uh, that are currently uh, non-imaging based, it might help, uh, uh, especially the urologist, uh, to decide whether to perform uh, an extended lymph node dissection or not in candidates for radical prostatectomy. So I think this is uh, some work for the future. I fully agree. I fully agree with you, but we still need some thresholds to apply who should get yes. a dissection. Yes. And the, the last point yes. I wanted to address is the old discussion on low versus high volume disease. Yes. Um, and it was the most provocative which, discussion. Well, it, it, yeah. the statement says that, of course, we should, that it changes the field, because may change the field of uh, metastatic or advanced uh, disease. But we still don't know what the number of metastases is uh, before it's low or high volume or how to use yeah. it in clinical practice. So I would, I would like to challenge you and your colleagues in the future to, to really come up with a, with a solid threshold uh, or at least a suggestion for it, how to uh, use that in, uh, in the future. Yes, I think we, we came with uh, an idea, uh, especially for the definition of oligometastatic disease, up to five metastases. So this is already uh, decided. And I was very happy to hear that even the medical oncologists agreed that nowadays it's not so important the high versus low risk volume disease, but it's especially important to have oligo versus polymetastatic disease, because this will make the, the difference between uh, systemic therapy or trying to only locally uh, treat these uh, patients. So, um, so maybe then the local... really last point I would like to address is anything which has been uh, important in MRI is, is learning curve and quality issues. And um, do you think that is just as relevant in PSMA scanning as in MRI? It's absolutely essential to have this learning uh, curve and to, to learn how to interpret the different types of PSMA, but especially knowing the, uh, for instance, tracers with atypical bone activity and to know uh, how to interpret the benign findings and not to uh, confound them with uh, metastatic deposits. I think this is essential. Uh, and this is our duty as nuclear medicine physician to educate the new generation and our colleagues as well. Yes. And when is your next consensus meeting uh, planned? Uh, next consensus meeting will be next year, but it won't be on the field of prostate cancer. It's been the breast cancer, but I, I'm sure that in one or two years, the next uh, consensus will be again in prostate cancer. Yes. It's hard to imagine for us as urologists that there's anything different from prostate cancer, of course. <laughs> Even for me as a nuclear medicine physician and a PSMA and a prostate cancer believer, it's hard to, but we'll try to to hard to to hardly work on this, and, and it will be promoted. I promise. And of course, it's good to have provocative urologists like Roderick uh, involved in your consensus statements to force us to think a little more. Um, can I um, uh, finally ask both of you this question? Because, of course, guidelines remain uh, the place we go to to uh, uh, help us make decisions for our patients based on best evidence. But these consensus statements often fill in the gap where the evidence isn't quite mature enough yet, but the clinical question is still there in front of us every day in the clinic. Uh, the guidelines are sometimes a bit behind, and um, Daniela, 
The current EAU guidelines, the 2023 guidelines, make a quite provocative statement saying that PSMA, although more accurate, um, uh, will change management in about one third of patients. And we should not do that. We should not change the management based on PSMA alone because we don't know yeah. does the change in management improve outcomes. Can I ask you for your thoughts on that statement that we shouldn't act on the, uh, the, the uh, information we see on this more accurate scan? Thank you, Declan. Uh, this is actually uh, a discussion that I, I have for uh, already a couple of years, uh, being also uh, involved in the EAU guidelines panel. Uh, so yes, the guidelines are made for whole Europe, to be, to, be, to be very honest, and actually not only for Europe, but for every country, also in America or in, uh, in Australia. Um, so we really need to uh to take care of what is possible in in some other countries and to realize and i fully uh, agree with this that we don't have the data right now telling us that uh, seeing more and treating the patients in a way that we didn't treat it in the in the era of uh, conventional imaging it means that the patients uh, will have a survival benefit so until the data is there we really need to be cautious of course i would like to say Let's go with only modern imaging, but I think it's important to realize what are also our caveats with imaging. <laughs> I, I'm surprised that Daniela is as cautious as she is being so knowledgeable as she also is in PSMA. Roderick, can I ask your thoughts on that uh, question I asked? So I'm in the guidelines panel as well, and I think that the evidence is always uh, prior, has always priority over like uh, lower uh, levels of evidence. But in the areas where there is no evidence, I think common sense is, of course, uh, something you can follow. And I think there are many cases we see in clinical practice where the PSMA provides us such a detailed uh, image of what's going on uh, over conventional imaging. And I think that then it is not, not against the law to use that common sense and only follow the guidelines. So... I think a combination of both um, is the ideal uh, situation. Very good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniela uh, Opre Lager and Roderick Vandenberg, for joining us to talk about this very nice paper. I encourage the audience to go and have a, a deep dive and watch out for more of these consensus statements coming soon. Thank you very much. So that was a great discussion, Declan, with yes. uh, Daniela and Roderick. Almost a full Dutch team. <laughs> It, it really was. And, and before they came on live, they were speaking Dutch. And uh, as I hinted at, Roderick actually worked here in Melbourne with us for a year. Oh, it must be seven or eight years ago. He was our fellow. Um, and we had another Dutch fellow uh, swapping over at the same time. And the pair of them used to speak Dutch in the operating theater to wind me up and uh, and say things about me behind my back. So one of these days, I'm going to I'm going to learn Dutch, Joyce. Don't you worry. <laughs> we regularly have Dutch guests, so probably you will learn. I know, exactly right. Um, and our second paper, uh, you had a chance to chat with um, Tamer Shah, urologist from Imperial College in London, um, about his paper. He's the senior author on the forecast trial. Uh, and you were also joined by our associate editor, our new associate editor for radiation oncology, Amar Kishan. So let's cross over uh, to hear Joyce's discussion about this really nice paper. So for the second paper we're going to discuss, we stay in the field of prostate cancer and imaging. Uh, the next paper we will discuss is on the role of multi-parametric MRI and MRI-targeted biopsy in the diagnosis of radio-recurrent prostate cancer. And this is an analysis from the forecast trial. Um, and we have two new guests. The first is the senior author of this, pacer, uh, of this paper. Um, this is uh, Dr. Taimur Shah. He, uh, he's a urologist at the Imperial College in London. And he's working in the Charing Cross Hospital. Uh, so very nice of you to be here today. And our second guest um, is Professor Dr. Amar Kishan. He's a professor of radiation oncology and urology at UCLA. Uh, also one of our associate editors of the journal. So also for you, very welcome. You have written a very nice editorial on the paper of uh, Time War. So uh, welcome and thank you for your time. Uh, to be here on this first podcast of 2024. So to start, um, Taimur, you have, um, uh, you did an evaluation uh, from the forecast trial looking at the role of MRI and MRI-targeted biopsy 
in rate recurrent prostate cancer. To start this discussion, would you uh, give us a brief summary of your study, something about the background and also the forecast trial and highlight your key findings of this study? Will do. Thank you, Joyce and Declan, for having me on the show. The And Happy New Year. Uh, the, the forecast trial was a multi-centre phase two study that sought to answer two questions in patients who were at risk of recurrent disease after radiotherapy. The first was to determine the diagnostic accuracy of multi-parametric MRI, and the second was actually to determine the outcome of patients who were suitable for and subsequently chose to undergo focal ablation. The current paper that we are discussing is reporting on the diagnostic accuracy of MRI, and it particularly focuses on biopsy strategies and penumbral sampling. Overall, we recruited 181 patients into the study, of which 144 were eligible for this analysis. Patients had either undergone a mapping biopsy or both mapping and targeted transperineal biopsies. Overall cancer detection was 77% at the whole gland level. And if we used Leica 3 as our threshold for an abnormal MRI, MRI actually had a sensitivity of well over 90%, but with quite poor specificity. If we had just done targeted biopsies, 7% of cancers would actually have been missed. And using a penumbral sampling strategy, we could reduce this to 2%, particularly if we incorporated neighboring quadrants. The other key finding from this study was when we actually looked at the data at a quadrant level. And when we did this, we found that 59% of patients actually had tumors within the non-targeted regions of their prostate. And these were the patients that would, would have been missed if we'd only taken targeted biopsies. Again, a more extensive, more systematic biopsy strategy reduced this to around 10%. And our take-home message from the forecast trial was that if you're at a purely diagnostic level, targeted biopsies may be appropriate. But if we want to characterize the disease particularly if we're looking to offer some form of targeted therapy, such as ablation or SBRT, then we still need to perform a systematic uh, biopsy. Great. Thank you. So, Amari, you have, have written a, a great editorial on the paper with a somewhat challenging title, Bullseye or Tip of the Iceberg. Would you, before you start the discussion uh, with Time Work, would you give your your, your reflection on the, uh, on the on the on this publication? Absolutely, and uh, thanks for having me on as well. And uh, congratulations, Time Work, and your your team on on excellent work with the study. <clears throat> I think this study is very important. Um, we don't have a you know a great understanding of radio recurrent disease in general, and it's very helpful to have high level data to help us guide even you know, in the diagnostic and therapeutic planning pathways, um, we know that there are multiple different treatment options and focal therapy of, of multiple forms is particularly compelling because in this group of patients, we really want to limit morbidity as best as we can. So I found um, the paper to be very well done and, and very valuable, you know, addition to the, to the literature. As you know, some of the takeaways from, from the paper for me were, again, as was highlighted, for therapeutic planning, it's very important to not just do a targeted biopsy in most cases, this idea of penumbral sampling or maybe sampling some of the quadrants around, I think is important, uh, especially in this era now, and, and we'll talk touch about this maybe in the question and answer, but you know, PSMA PET in addition to MRI, I think there's a lot of people that are moving away from even saying you, you need a biopsy, which, which I think is clearly a mistake. Uh, and particularly for planning these types of therapies, you know, it's, it's important to have that information. Um, in terms of some of the questions that, that I might ask, um, I think maybe a general one to start off since you mentioned focal therapies and, and I mentioned it as well. So you, you noted that of the 79 patients that had adequate data to evaluate eligibility for focal therapy, about 43 or so would have been suitable um, for focal therapies or, you know, based off the, the results. How do you, how do you incorporate that into your practice and you know what what would you recommend to someone that's planning focal therapy how do you approach that so overall actually we so for this analysis we we found that approximately 60% so 59% would have been eligible for some form of focal ablation 
And overall, from the study, we actually treated 93 patients with focal ablation, so of those 181. And we've, we've, ha- we've actually changed a few things we do in clinical practice because we've been offering focal, focal therapy, but actually we've been offering whole gland treatments for a lot longer. And the problem we have with patients with recurrent disease is actually they have very limited options often. Um, we've got quite extensive morbidity from radical surgery. And so we offer focal to those that are suitable, and that could be a hemiablation if, if necessary. It could be a dog leg. Or we will offer whole gland treatments to to patients who have more extensive disease. One of the interesting kind of results from from the analysis, which I think we need to kind of do a little bit more work on and probably tease out over some future papers, is the the MRI negative disease. It often tended to be lower grade, tended to be lower volume. It wasn't always. We, there were some high grade tumors that were missed, but it did tend to be a bit lower. And what we don't really understand is is the biology in the same way as we do with primary disease in radio recurrent disease. And is there an argument actually to potentially treat the index lesion even in a radio recurrent setting? So possibly leave some of this cancer behind as it may not lead to progression. And I think that's a little bit of work we still need to do in this in this relatively high risk group of patients. And that's, that's a good segue into the next kind of question I had for you, which is that a large number of these patients, I think, had Gleason grade group one at presentation uh, in the median interval to evaluation in forecast or enrollment in forecast was seven years or so. And so is it possible that this percentage of MRI occult disease is higher um, because of this preponderance of lower grade lesions, late recurrences, as opposed to maybe, you know, a contemporary population of patients that may have higher risk disease? Uh, for for instance, how 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 do you think about that? Um, it's an interesting observation. When we looked at the re the the, the grading at uh, essentially re biopsy, we found virtually no low grade disease. It was almost all grade group two and above, and and quite a lot of grade group three, four, and five disease. And so the question is, what happened to that grade group one disease that we had at the beginning? My my gut feeling is it was probably undersampled. This is, the, these are patients who, as you said, on at median seven to eight years. So many actually were treated even longer than that. Um, and this was predates MRI or good quality MRI, predates a lot of our biopsy techniques. So I suspect it, it, it just represents undersampling. And they probably always harbored higher grade disease. We just don't have the original tumor blocks because they're so old to be able to go back and re-report some of the specimens, but even then, they may not have captured the the actual index lesion. And how do you think PSMA might have played into this, um, in the sense that the median PSA, I think, in in this cohort was about 3.8 or so? So Mm -hmm. we would expect PSMA PET to be positive in some location in these patients, right? Um, So how how does that play into your your diagnostic pathway and and maybe the interpretation of the results? So... um... I'm, I've actually almost lost equipoise in the use of PSMA PET in this disease. I'm not, I'm still waiting for results in primary disease. And I know um, Declan's done a lot of work on this as well. And there's a lot of data. I've got the primary two study, but in, in radio current disease, I'm, I'm starting to lose a little bit of equipoise because one, it's for staging. We used choline PET. And you, even with that, one in four patients had metastatic or nodal disease when they presented with biochemical failure. And I suspect we'll see a lot more lesions on PSMA PET. But the other is for local disease characterization. And MRI is notoriously difficult in, in, in post-radiation. And the reason it had such a high sensitivity is because a lot of patients had like three lesions because they weren't able to confidently say whether this was a dis- definitely a disease or not. And we've looked at this actually in a small group of patients now um, at the paper is in press at the moment, where we combined PSMA PET and multi-parametric MRI. And what we actually find is a much better sensitivity for disease localization, but also we get a much better NPV, which is now well above 90% if you combine the two tests. So potentially we might be we might be heading in a direction where we could potentially even omit biopsies in some patients and place them on a period of surveillance rather than 
further invasive tests. So I, 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 as I said, I've almost lost equipoise. We need, I haven't because we need the studies to be able to show that the combined um, imaging modalities are beneficial. But I think that's that's the direction of travel here. And, and kind of maybe on that note, you, you mentioned the difficulty of interpreting MRI findings after um, radiation. And this study used the, the Likert scale because, of course, you know, stuff like the pi RR that, that just wasn't mm -hmm. out or available at the time forecast was conducted. I think in general, uh, a common criticism of MRI imaging in the definitive setting and then particularly in the radio recurrent setting is potentially a lack of generalizability. How would you uh, address that and how do you think about that? So I think pi RR is a, is a big step in the right direction. We had a lot of expert radiologists. Many of these radiologists were involved in promise. They were involved in precision. They'd been uh, around for a very long time also whilst focal therapy was developing. So they had a lot of experience in reporting these scans. And and we know there's a lot of inter-radiologist uh, variability, even using pyrads in the primary setting. And so I think there is a little bit of uh, um, issues we have where we need to try and develop systems to allow non-expert, non-tertiary uh, center radiologists to be able to review these scans and um, and produce essentially a high-level report. One one thing I believe probably for 2024, we've seen a lot of this in 2023, and we haven't really got data yet in this cohort, but hopefully will do, is the use of AI. I'm seeing some fantastic data on how AI performs in the primary setting at the level of a of a general radiologist, not at the level of an expert, but that but general radiologist is good enough, and they outperform uh, um, many radiologists out there. I'm not saying we remove them from the pathway. But that may be something that helps interpretation in the interpretation of these very difficult scans. I agree. I think it's an area that will be ripe for AI-based tools. I, I think the, I know I agree with much of what you said. The only thing that I'm and, I, and you put a cautionary note on it. The only thing I might say is that in our practice, there, there have been some false negative biopsies, even with a PSMA. Uh, PET and MRI suggestive of a lesion. And, and sometimes, you know, we don't know the response after radiation very well, right? And, and there can be artifact, there can be PSMA heterogeneous, ex, you know, expression that's not actually a recurrent disease. So I still think, uh, you know, a biopsy will be helpful for that reason, even with PSMA PET and, you know, MP MRI and a high MPV. And then, and then also for grading purposes, even though the grading system is not perfect, you know, it might help prognostically to know if this recurrence is a marginal miss of an original Gleason grade one, or is it actually a, a Gleason eight, you know, recurrence. But uh, again, as I mentioned, fan fantastic work. Uh, I enjoyed reading the study and, and commenting on it. Thank you. So I think it was a really great uh, discussion. Thank you, Amar and Taimu, for your time today uh, to be on this podcast. And I really would encourage your listeners to read the original paper and your editorial, of course. So thank you for being here today. Um, and we will all read your papers, of course. So now we're moving on to um, the other favorite segment we have within the podcast where we have a look at what else uh, caught our eye in this month's edition of European Urology. This is the uh, section that Nikita Bat has chaired for the first few editions of the podcast. But while Nikita is off on maternity leave, um, we have a kind of rotating roster of uh, senior trainees from uh, around Europe, maybe around the world. We haven't uh, fully finished this uh, uh, roster yet, uh, who uh, dip into the rest of the contents of the journal and tell us what else caught their eye. So this month, it's uh, it's a great uh, uh, privilege to welcome fellow countrywoman, um, Dr. Stephanie Crohan, uh, who is a senior urology trainee at Beaumont Hospital in Dublin. And Stephanie has kindly agreed to join us to see uh, what else caught her eye in the podcast this month. Stephanie, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure, Declan. Great. And I know you're quite involved in um, trainee matters. You're on the BURST committee, which of course Nikita is on as well. And I think you're on some committees involved in research in Ireland as well. Yes, uh, I am. Um, I think they're a great chance to, you know, promote collaborative research and connect with colleagues. Um, I've learned a lot from those experiences. Um, Excellent. And tell me, are you someone who likes, who enjoys a podcast? 
I am. Uh, I would say I am probably a little bit of a technological Luddite, a little bit slow to the podcast game, but I have uh, certainly gotten on the bandwagon um, in the last couple of years and finding them really useful for both urology um, and just general interest matters. Fantastic. Okay, so let's go over to you. I think you've picked out uh, three different papers you want to highlight. Uh, Tell us about the first of them. I have, yep. We have a great edition of European Neurology for some New Year's reading, um, and I have chosen three papers um, to highlight for the podcast. The first is a brief correspondence on how well artificial intelligence chatbots respond to search queries about neurological malignancies from New York. I think um, it's a really timely correspondence piece in what is obviously a rapidly evolving area. The authors basically found top Google search queries for common neurological malignancies and plugged these into various AI chatbots to assess the information yielded. I think it's a really useful article. It's really important, um, I feel, as clinicians to have insight into patient sources of information. I tried out chatbots myself earlier in the year. Um, I did notice the propensity of some to fabricate research papers for references. So I have to say say that quite alarming. But um, as I mentioned, I'm pretty new to the technological game, so not sure. Um, Certainly in this paper, reassuringly, it seems that the information yielded was generally accurate. But the authors did comment that language and patient readability um, were lacking. So for the time being, it seems to me the chatbots are probably an inferior resource to high quality patient information leaflets that perhaps we can direct patients to ourselves, but it's a rapidly growing area. So I guess we all need to watch this space. Sure is. What do you think, Joyce? Have you any any thoughts on ChatGPT and these um, AI chatbots for doing searches on urological stuff? Or are you finding any patients doing that? No, I, 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 well, I'm not using ChatGPT or things like that quite often. And I haven't heard any of my patients talking about this. But if you look at social media, I think there's really a lot of misinformation if you talk about different uh, medical topics. And I think that's really worrisome. So on one hand, I think it's encouraging to read that the... Um, well, there's no misinformation if you do some searches on this chat bot box. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, it, it will probably depend on your patient group. Uh, if you have younger patients, they probably will go to the internet. And I agree with you, we need good patient information. But in the end, we cannot prevent them from going to the internet and Google things or go to chat GPT. So on one hand, it's encouraging. There's no misinformation. but we should uh, maybe maybe I should ask my patients more actively to, yeah. if they uh, make use of things like this. Yeah. And I, I think what Stephanie said is interesting. That, yeah, it is interesting, but it's the inaccuracy. And we've talked about this technology a lot on GU Cast, our main podcast, over the past few years. And it's uh, one of the comments I recall last year was someone said, uh, ChatGPT uh, can be very convincing when it blurts out a whole pile of information about a urological condition. Oh, that sounds very impressive. Uh, but it can be very inaccurate. <laughs> it can be very convincingly and confidently incorrect about something. And so, yeah have to actually check it very carefully because it sounds so convincing but actually that's completely wrong um, and I think that's a little bit different to people just doing general searches on Google because they they are more likely to at least find themselves in reputable places at least for the first uh, page or two on Google searches and then social media kind of sits in between it that, that whole misinformation disinformation era but yeah. um, I think that'll be one of our challenges going forward with patient information in coming years is trying to sift all that out um, and one of the, the concerns about the whole generative AI field is that it effectively is is creating more and more and more content all the time. It's it's creating generative AI content about generative AI content. So if the first thing was inaccurate, the second, third, yeah. fourth layer of it uh, will certainly be inaccurate. But um, yeah, very nice paper. We'll put a we'll put a link in the notes. So please go and have a look at that and update yourself on it. Um, uh, what else, uh, Steph? Sure, yeah. This, the second paper then that caught my eye is a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at the role of 99 technetium cestamibi CT in the diagnostic pathway for renal masses. It's a paper from Italy. Um, I recall back at an AUA, I think it was the 2019 one, there was a lot of chat about this um, and then things went a little bit quieter since. So it's nice to see um, an integrated update on the matter. 
essentially, Sestamibi seems, um, from my reading of this paper, to be performing well for differentiation of oncocytomas from aggressive renal tumor subtypes, but not so much so regarding hybrid and chromophobe, chromophobe types, um, and the evidence quality is still pretty limited. So I think the clinical role does remain uncertain, but perhaps a future place in a diagnostic pathway um, may emerge, um, and it is an interesting read. Yeah, I agree. I, I recall, it, I think it was work from Johns Hopkins a few years ago, uh, looking at cystamoebe uh, to differentiate these oncocytomas from renal cell carcinoma, and quite encouraging. And in that group of patients, of course, it's usually a biopsy where we're reaching for to try and help us figure out is this a benign lesion or a malignant lesion and biopsy in itself well is invasive but also has limitations so it is encouraging that a non-invasive um, uh, intervention like cystamoebe can help but it's interesting how it hasn't really punched through into into the big time uh, since the initial work I just think probably enough work hasn't been done on it I think there probably is value there but uh, this systematic review is a good summary of the overall work and probably we should be embracing this more in prospective uh, trials. It's easy to do. We ran a f quite a few cystamoebes after we saw the original data from Johns Hopkins and it did look good, but there was also, you know, it, it still was difficult to avoid um, a biopsy if we really still had some uncertainty because the decision about a partial nephrectomy or a nephrectomy um, is such a big deal for some of these patients. Uh, Absolutely. That's the second one. And then you have a third paper, a final one. Yes, um, finally, um, a summary of the 2023 EAU guidelines on muscle invasive and metastatic bladder cancer is found in this edition. Um, it's great to see innovation and evolution in, in bladder cancer treatment as traditionally it's probably received less attention than other urological malignancies. So I think this guideline is really nice to see. It includes discussions of MRI staging, robotic approaches, immunotherapy, etc. Um, so very cutting edge. Um, and I think it's, it's obviously a must read for anyone involved in the area of bladder cancer treatment. Yeah, there's nothing like a big EAU guidelines paper, Joyce, is there to uh, uh, draw our attention to. Um, it's that time of the year coming up to a main EAU meeting where some updated guidelines get released. And this one on um, muscle invasive and metastatic bladder cancer is, is very important indeed. Um, any comments from you on this, Joyce? No, I think it's, it's an, uh, well, it's impressive work, these guidelines updates, and it's really covering all aspects of uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer. So uh, for me also... As an endourologist, a good article to, le to read to be updated again. Yeah, and of course, I know you do a lot of upper tract uh, TCC cancer work in your endourology yes. practice as well. So, yes. Um, but I think, yeah. you know, the, the thing with this guideline, it's, it's a really nice one. But goodness me, things are moving so quickly in metastatic yeah. and, and muscle invasive bladder cancer over the past even six or nine months alone that this uh, guideline is almost out of date already. Um, and so I think, uh, which is great news for bladder cancer, where you know, really very little has changed for so many years, unfortunately. But now we have a whole bunch of really amazing interventions, especially for metastatic bladder cancer, um, that uh, it's actually quite good to say that we need to, we look forward to the next iteration of this guideline, hopefully next year, that will update us on some really, really important work. So yeah, very good, Stephanie. Thank you very much for all that. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Great, great to have you on the podcast and thank you for joining us. And if you are a senior trainee out there who's interested in joining us for this segment, we're going to be still welcoming guests probably up until mid-2024 uh, until Nikita comes back from her maternity leave. So just get in touch, send us an email at platinum at europeanurology.com and we'll be happy to uh, get in touch with you. Um, so that's all we have for this segment again and thanks very much, Stephanie, for joining us. Take care, thank you. So that's all we have time for on this, the January edition of the European Urology Podcast. We're looking forward to a really good podcasting year ahead of us. We thank you all very much for tuning in and listening to us, and hopefully we'll bump into you here and there. We'll be at the European Urology stand at the EAU meeting, and we may well record an extra bonus episode of the European Urology Podcast uh, from there. But I'll hand over to Joyce uh, to wrap up. Yeah, so make sure you are keep updated, subscribe to our channel, um, walk by if you're uh, visiting EAU, of course. Um, and if you have any comments, I always end with this. If you have comments, if you have any tips, please leave them. Uh, send us a message and uh, hope we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.